Uh, so my name is uh, Ashok Krishnamurthy. I am uh, currently the interim director for RENCI, the Renaissance Computing Institute. RENCI is a, a research computing institute that is uh, housed at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. But it has a unique role in the sense that uh, by, by state mandate, we actually work with uh, closely with both uh, Duke University as well as North Carolina State University. So we, we, we sort of have a, a role with all three. Mm -hmm. um, so the, so I also am a, a, a research professor in the computer science department at, uh, at UNC Chapel Hill. Isma, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, um, I'm Isma Gilani and I am the interim director of software architecture group here at RENSI. And uh, we are responsible for um, building uh, Helix and Edu Helix uh, platforms that Ashok and I will be talking about today. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Sman. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I wanna get started uh, on, 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 on the topic itself. And, and uh, I think Isma will give you a little bit more detail about this, but uh, as part of an NIH uh, funded project, we uh, created a software platform, a workspace platform called Helix that was really used to begin with to provide imaging services for uh, the National Heart, Lung and uh, Blood Institute. Uh, since then, we have, uh, through the leadership of uh, Isma and, and Steve Cox uh, before her, uh, actually made Helix into a multi-purpose platform so we can actually build many different vertically integrated applications out of Helix as a core technology. And one of the things that we did when we were looking at, uh, at um, Helix was, he said, here is a fantastic platform for actually doing things around uh, uh, data science education and training. And, and uh, uh, I have been teaching a course uh, that is around uh, data science. It, it, you could call it an introduction to data science course uh, for several years. And uh, when, when we saw where we could take Helix, it looked like it was a great way to, to create a, a version of Helix that would be extremely useful and, and, and address many of the issues uh, I was running into, I and Stan Aholt and John Majekis were the three people who were teaching this course, uh, into while we are actually running it. So that's how we created uh, this version of Helix or, or, or this vertical of Helix called Edu Helix. Uh, last year, uh, UNC Chapel Hill also launched a data science minor. Uh, and uh, I am one of the uh, faculty members on the minor committee uh, and the, the data and and right now we have over uh, 500 as of the spring semester. I think there are more have signed up to 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 be a part of this minor for 500 students. The requirements for the minor are fairly straightforward. Uh, the 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 minor consists of five courses, three of which are core courses, and then two electives after that. The idea is that the core courses give you some of the fundamentals you need to be a effective a data science person. And then the electives you choose based on your particular area of interest. So for example, you could choose electives if you wanted to in machine learning and deep learning if you're a computer science person, you could, uh, you could uh, choose electives in uh, epidemiology if that's what your interest is, etc. So it, 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 the electives really give you a way of taking what you are learning in the core and applying it to a number of different areas. Uh, you can see there's three core requirements: data and computational thinking, data and statistical thinking, and data culture and society. Uh, the particular core requirement I'm going to talk about is data and computational thinking. Okay. Go to the next slide, uh, Isma. Uh, so the data and computational thinking uh, is is so. The basic idea is that you know there's there's always been courses in computational thinking. So the courses in computational thinking is not necessarily new, uh, and, and and you can think of it in many different ways. The the sort of uh, angle that we brought in is to say that you know what. 
uh, a lot of data analysis and data science and data management is, is really also requires you to be able to think of how you can uh, process, manipulate, collect, distribute, uh, analyze, visualize the data itself. And it's worthwhile to have a course that sort of provides the computer science skills, coding skills around what would be needed to be an effective uh, data scientist. Uh, and there is not a single course that you can take that you have to take to fulfill this requirement. As you can see right now, there are four different courses uh, that you could take to fulfill that requirement. Two of them are from the computer science department. One is from geography and one is from political science. Uh, the, the the basic requirement that we have in all of these courses, uh, the, the way we we, uh, we chose these courses is that it has to be uh, it has to be built around a, a, a ability to teach you programming that it, that even if you come with uh, no programming or coding background that it'll actually give you some. The exact language that is used is not as important uh, as giving you the necessary concepts and the programming that you are taught or the coding that you're taught has to be uh, uh, hands-on and assignment-based, that it's not just a theoretical exercise. Uh, and also that the, the, the assignments necessarily have to do with data, that you just can't run a simulation and say, okay, I now know how to run for loops. It has to be built around data in some kind, uh, way, shape or form. So that was sort of the broad guidelines we used. The one, the course that that uh, that uh, that I've been teaching, along with, like I said, Stan A. Holt and uh, John Majekis, is Comp 116, which has a name that says Introduction to Scientific Programming. That's because that's a name that existed long before data science ever became where, what it is now. Uh, so you could say that its uh, its uh, real name is an introduction to uh, you know computational thinking and data science. That's where that's what it really is. Okay. Uh, we have been enrolling about 400 students a year, uh, about 250 in the fall semester and about 150 in the spring semester. And we basically are kind of topped over there because of room sizes and things like that. Okay. Next slide, please, as well. So what is involved in teaching Compound 16? It, uh, the Compound 16 is, a, is, a, is, is Python based. We teach them to program in Python and we use Jupyter Notebooks uh, as a programming interface. Everything we do in the course is based on Jupyter Notebooks, lectures, worksheets, quizzes, examinations, uh, uh, programming projects. These are all the different artifacts that are involved in the course. Every one of these exists as a Jupyter Notebook that is then shared with the student, okay? Uh, to help us handle these very large class sizes, uh, a couple of the faculty members at, 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 uh, in the computer science department developed a set of tools that makes uh, managing the course a lot easier. Uh, we have a tool called a Fetcher. Uh, oh, oh, these tools are all basically Python libraries. Okay? Uh, the, we have a tool called Fetcher, which uh, allows students to easily download course material. Uh, a tool called Submitter, which allows students to submit their completed work. Okay? A tool called Checker, which actually provides feedback to the students as they are working on their code. So, you know, as you know, a Jupyter Notebook is, is, is based on, on, on cells. So if you can complete a cell and actually run it, and, 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 in, and then if you run the checker after you've written your code, it'll give you feedback. There's three levels of feedback with increasing levels of specificity. So for example, if it is a, a worksheet, which is, which is sort of the learning medium that we use, or if it is in a lecture, the feedback may actually say, well, I was actually expecting uh, an integer here, but what I got from you is a string, okay? So it, it's kind of giving you quite a bit of hint as to what may be wrong with your code. Whereas if it's, if you're, you know, you students can run the checker even in an exam, we include the checker in an exam too, in that case, the feedback may be just, okay, I got your answer. So that's just more to tell the student we accepted it, doesn't give them any hint as to whether they are on the right track or not. So you can adjust it, uh, at the, the level of feedback. You also have a grader, which is basically um, an ability to take an exam or a quiz or a worksheet and, and put it into a containerized environment and, and, and run it so we can do auto grading. 
The one thing I would have to say that both the checker and the grader, uh, they only check for the correctness of the answer. They're not necessarily checking the code. There's a little bit of checking that may happen. We may be able to see if, if for example, uh, a, a student uh, is using list comprehension when we had said you couldn't. So there may be a little bit of things like that, but it's mostly checking the answer. We have used EduHelix. So I, like I said, this course we have been teaching for a while, uh, but we have uh, used EduHelix to teach this twice uh, in fall 2021 and spring 2022. Go to the next slide, please. So why why did we choose to go to EduHelix? Uh, so you know before before fall 2021, we were asking students to install Anaconda on their computers. This worked. We have taught it many times using that, but it has many issues, and really it 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 results in instructor and TA distraction and student frustration. Some of the things are, you know, somebody has Windows, somebody has Mac OS, and we actually had a few students who, who you know, preferred operating system as Linux. We always have uh, uh, issues with version and version control and, and you know, different versions. Uh, if, if, if the students have a problem and we need to debug it, we literally have to, you know, sit next to them, we, you know, before we can see their code, it's, a, it's a, 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 you know, which, which works okay. Uh, but of course, with, with remote learning, it's, it's a little harder. So we would have to use uh, Zoom to look at the student screen. Uh, that necessarily limited how many students we could work with at the same time. So there were some issues there, not all of which EduHelix solves, but some of them. Laptop failures were a problem. When, when you have 250 students, you can be sure that somebody's laptop is going to crash in, in, in the middle of the semester and then and then they are in a total state of panic, they lost everything. What do I do now? We even used to have networking issue. The 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 the, uh, the, the um, checker and the and the and the fetcher and the submitter all uh, talk to a server and and sometimes because of some networking changes that somehow magically happened to the student's laptop, suddenly it doesn't work. Uh, we would constantly run into conflicts because some software somewhere auto upgraded and made some changes. So suddenly their uh, Jupyter notebook is not working, et cetera, et cetera. So we used to be a net, net loss of time that was uh, unrelated to the actual uh, uh, instructional material we want to convey to the students. With EduHelix, all they need is a Chrome browser. So they don't even need a full laptop. So if you have a, a, any kind of a, a device that, that provides you the Chrome browser, that's all you need. And you can, you can do all of the material that you could do before. Okay. So that's, so, so I, I've given you from an instructor's perspective why we went to EduHelix. And now I'll turn it over to Isma to tell you about the magic behind EduHelix. Thank you, Ashok. So as Ashok um, uh, stated earlier, EduHelix is a vertical um, domain of Helix and Helix um, is built by Renzi and it is a scientific computing platform um, built to address the need um, of robust cyber infrastructure in the cloud. Uh, we have um, thus far deployed um, specific Helix domains to um, aid research and um, science uh, by sharing and ingesting and um, analyzing scientific data. Uh, Helix provides a wide array of data science tools um, in a modern cloud native environment. And it provides that with appropriate security, networking and persistent storage. And it's deployed uh, as a customizable and configurable domain specific to the user community. So uh, the, the researchers in, in, in genomics may have a different uh, suite of tools than the researchers in, um, uh, in Edu or, well, or, or users of EduHelix. So it's, it's very dependent on, dependent on the tools and the workspace is requested by, by the users. And we, we do a fair amount of research and interfacing with the users to determine what they need and how we can provide that for them. 
it empowers researchers um, with computational workspaces close to their data in the cloud. Um, it, it aids by, by um, the, the instruction and learning in a classroom environment pro by providing customizable computing environments for data science courses, as, as Ashok has mentioned, for EduHelix. This is um, a very high level architecture for Helix. It um, outlines the different components that are used to provide this uh, scalable platform. So uh, it, it, in short, it tells you that Helix is deployable on many cloud infrastructures, whether on-premise, um, GCP or AWS. It provides containerization uh, using a Docker and um, orchestration using Kubernetes. Our deployment is done, done through Helm and we interface a wide array of uh, data management um, technologies to provide storage, whether it's using Renzi's iRods or uh, Google Cloud Storage or Amazon S3 Storage. Uh, we have a Helix UI which uses um, Nginx and Ambassador for mappings um, and for um, user experiences. We have customizable uh, components that we have written um, at, you know, at RENC by the software architecture group developers, which provide um, the uh, launching of apps and all the network services. And then we have cust uh, custom apps based on the domain. Um, to provide the user um, research, the users and the researchers, the appropriate tools that they need to do their, um, to, to execute their uh, use cases. So Azure Helix um, is a specific instance of Helix and it was developed for, for classroom instruction. Um, it was specialized for Compound 16. Um, so an individual educator and course and um, we worked with, the Helix team worked with UNCITS to deploy EduHelix for Comp 16 in um, GCP for fall 21 and spring of 22 semesters. The GCP cluster was equipped with enough resources to support simultaneous notebook launch and execution for hundreds of users. And the costs were covered by UNCITS. The Compound 16 instance of Azure Helix was built with workspaces consisting of uh, specialized Jupyter notebooks preloaded with the required Python environment and modules needed to complete and submit assignments and exams. And all, all of this was hosted in a Kubernetes environment. We had Dockerized, Dockerized processes running on servers in computer science department, which were used for grading student submit, submissions. And these were the fetcher and the checker and uh, the, uh, um, that Ashok had mentioned earlier. We provided uh, continuous monitoring of cluster resources and, and provided metrics um, to, um, to educators and to the users um, for insights into resource allocation and usage. And by users, I mean, the, the, I, what I mean here is the cloud, um, um, the provisioners of the technology, not the user base itself. This is uh, Azure Helix Compound 16 architecture at a glance, uh, very similar to the Helix uh, based on the Helix architecture. So we have Kubernetes in the mix. We have um, a Helix UI, which uses um, SAML authentication to, um, so onion-based authentication uh, for, for each user in the class. Uh, we have custom apps consisting of Jupyter and a file browser for saving the data locally. Uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, compiled with the Comp 16 modules to execute uh, the grading and the fetching of, uh, of assignments. And then we have the underlying pieces which allowed us to monitor and gather analytics on resource allocation in the, in the GCP cluster. 
and to better scale our, um, our application. The future of EduHelix, we uh, want to use it to do great things, especially in the area of, uh, um, uh, of, of data science. So we, would, we will be collaborating with the School of Data Science and Society to uh, leverage EduHelix as its educational platform. So to support this initiative, and this is a very ambitious initiative, we, uh, the development team is compiling a list of essential enhancements, um, including unified workspaces for multiple course offerings, integration with better uh, grading tools, and addition of R and R Studio for, uh, to the computational suite, and integration with the campus LMS. And that's the end of the presentation.